Before the telegraph, before the telephone, there were mail services. Either by runners, by sea, or by horse, communication through written documents had several different methods of travel. But to the United States, which had just secured its nation of two oceans, a service on a previously unheard of scale was required. The start of that service was the Pony Express, an overland mail delivery service that could cross the distance from St. Joseph, Missouri to Sacramento, California in just 10 days. Days. While only active for 18 months, it was integral in shaping America's West and still influences American culture to this day. So join me as we explore the story of the Pony Express and discover what remains of its legacy. I'm your host, Ryan Sokash, and you're watching It's History. Expansion westward was one of the driving forces behind the American Revolution. Its foreign policy remained focused on that goal in its first years. For example, one of the most prolific dealings of the time was the 1803 Louisiana Purchase, which doubled the size of the country with the signing of a document. These interactions were not always peaceful. For example, in the War of 1812, American troops attempted and failed an invasion of Canada. In fact, the Louisiana Purchase was one of the few examples of peaceful expansion, be it one that involved driving natives further out west. The 1848 Treaty of Guadalupe Hidalgo, which ended the Mexican-American War, included the Mexican Secession, which turned 55% of Mexico's territory over to the United States. States. This territory included present-day Arizona, California, New Mexico, Colorado, Nevada, Utah, and Texas, and crucially completed one of America's founding goals, to become a nation of two oceans. These expansions were all very bloody affairs, killing hundreds of thousands of people in the pursuit of drawing lines on a map. However, to most people, the idea of westward expansion doesn't invoke images of blood-soaked trails, of tears, but that of cowboys, outlaws, horses, and trains. So considering the reality, you might be asking yourself, where do we get this cartoonish image of westward expansion? Well, the obvious answer is Hollywood and spaghetti western movies. It goes back further than that. They got those ideas from the Pony Express. The United States' government was always brainstorming about ways to encourage westward expansion, but many people of the nation didn't need any incentive. The prospect of driving out west and making a new home and name was more than enough to entice settlers. But others also had their reasons. For example, the 1847 Mormon exodus saw tens of thousands of people facing religious persecution move out of the Mexican-controlled Utah only to have the United States come to them once more a year later. The 1849 California Gold Rush also brought hundreds of thousands out to the Pacific coast seeking riches in the riverbeds. Be they fleeing, seeking fortune, or just a better lot in life than they had, there was now a population of hundreds of thousands of Americans on the western frontier. Many of these people wanted to send out letters updating their loved ones on their situation, which posed a big logistical problem. It was hard enough migrating out west in the first place, and now there was a need for consistent round trips from east to west. And there really wasn't any other efficient way to do it at this point. The Panama Canal was still 50 years away, and water travel would have required circumnavigating the entire southern American continent. Regardless, there were attempts at both overland stagecoach companies operating horse-drawn mail carts across the frontier trails. Steamships either circumnavigated South America or took overland transfer by mule and canoes across the Isthmus of Panama or the Isthmus of Tehuantepec in Mexico. Predictably, these messages had their problems. Steamships frequently encountered problems circumnavigating the South American continent simply due to how long the journey was, as it took multiple months at best. Overland transfers didn't fare much better, as travelers crossing often faced malaria. 
Regardless, these messages arrived in a span of months and cost the government $700,000 or $25.5 million in today's money every year and only returned $200,000 or $7.27 million today in that same time metric. All things considered, this was hardly efficient even by the standards of the time. The overland route faced similar hardships. The first attempt in 1851 had George Charpenning and Absalom Woodward contracting with the U.S. government for monthly deliveries between Sacramento, California and Salt Lake City, Utah. Through the Carson Valley, they assembled basic relay stations along the route, making the trip a bit easier. From there, stagecoaches took the messages from Salt Lake City to Independence, Missouri. This mail service became the main method, and although it often suffered from bad weather, especially in the winter, as well as attacks from Native Americans encountered along the way, it seemed to be the best they could do for the time. However, when these operations fell through, due in part to Woodward, Don in a journey from Sacramento to Salt Lake City in 1951, another mail company took over with a new southern route. This route took mail from St. Louis, Missouri, down to Little Rock, Arkansas, through El Paso, Texas, westward to Yuma, Arizona, then on to Los Angeles and San Francisco, a 2,700-mile journey over a 25-day schedule. This sufficed for a while, but a major conflict brewing in the South made the system unattainable. Towards the end of the 1850s, northern and southern tensions boiled to new heights, and when it came to the mail, news of these tensions needed to be communicated quickly, or there could be dire consequences for the western holdings. So the politicians of California took to brainstorming a better way. Senator William M. Gwynn is often attributed with suggesting the prevailing idea to a private freighting firm, Russell Majors and Waddell. That idea was the post Express, a horse relay across the entire American frontier. Surprisingly, it wasn't the only horse relay that covered this type of distance throughout history. The longest and first horse relay of this scale belonged to the Mongolians, who under Genghis Khan operated between stations 25 miles apart, with one message traveling upwards of 300 miles in one day. It was also done before in America, as newspapers used horse relays from New York and Boston in the latter half of the 1820s. However, America hadn't tried something this big before, and it wasn't even the only or best idea for communication at the time. That goes to the telegraph, as its expansion coincided with these times. But electric telegraph cables took time to build, and with the South about to secede from the Union, there was no time to spare. So by January of 1860, implementation was well underway and scheduled to start in April. The resulting route covered 1,966 miles, half of which followed the Oregon Trail. Starting in St. Joseph, Missouri, it passed through Kansas, Nebraska, Colorado, Wyoming, and Utah. From Salt Lake City, the path deviated from the Oregon Trail going southwest into Nevada and ending in Sacramento, California. The route promised letters and newspapers to travel across the trail in just 10 days, requiring the riders to ride their horses at top speeds at all times. A downside of this was the horse got tired extremely quickly, forcing riders to change horses every 10 to 15 miles, terrain dependent. To accommodate this, the company established 197 relay stations. A rider took his special mail-designed saddlebag called a mochila, attached it to a new mount, and departed as quickly as possible. If the rider himself was too tired to continue, having ridden all day and night, there were several home stations across the trail where he could pass the mochila to a new rider. Afterward, the station supplied him with food and lodging to rest. Most of these stations, especially in Utah and Nevada's barren lands, had to be built from complete scratch. The first ride of the Pony Express took place on April the 3rd, 1860, with the first mochila including a letter from President James Buchanan to Governor John Downey of California with congratulations on the Pony Express. It arrived in Sacramento at 5.45 p.m. 
on April the 13th, exactly 10 days after departing, to a great deal of fanfare. And well, it had not been the first horse relay of its kind or even the longest, it was certainly the fastest. Many of these riders were young, some in their early teens, but regardless of that, they took on some of the most important jobs in the country. And to emphasize this point, Russell, Majors, and Waddell required every rider to take an oath in which they swore off profanity, intoxication, and conflicts with their co-workers. The oath went as follows. In every respect, I will conduct myself honestly, be faithful to my duties, and so direct all my acts as to win the confidence of my employer. So help me God. This commitment did not go unnoticed by the general population either. Riders of the Pony Express quickly secured special social status in American society as they were essential in connecting the nation. The very press they served built them up as heroes, enshrining some forever in the annuals of history. One of the best known riders was William Cody, or better known as Buffalo Bill. Among his many exploits was the 22-hour ride in Wyoming, from Red Butte Station to Pacific Springs and back, covering around 300 miles in one near-continuous stretch. While well, authors and publicity agents of the time mythologized many of his adventures, several accounts confirm his heroic escapes from the highwaymen and natives alike, and this is just the tip of the iceberg. Another prolific rider was Pony Bob. Haslam, who ran from Friday's station on the southwest shore of Lake Tahoe out to Buckland Station, then 90 miles through the hostile territory of the Paiute when another rider did not wish to face them. Immediately afterward, he replaced a missing rider from a return voyage and rescued a station master from Indians, in total traveling 360 miles in just 40 hours on horseback. There was also Jack Keatley who rode 340 miles in 31 hours without rest, arriving at the final destination asleep in the saddle. So with all these storied figures, it's a small wonder that the idea of the Wild West entered popular culture as such a mainstay. No matter how long the Pony Express stayed in operation, these stories of grandeur were irresistible to the public and the press that served it. In 18 months of operation, the Pony Express had turned the concept of the American frontier into a whimsical land of cowboys and Indians, where daring acts of heroism came with every letter, and those letters always came in. There was only one lost machilla in all of the 18 months of operation. However, the Pony Express was a stopgap measure by design, as during its operational years, the transcontinental telegraph line had always been under construction. As mentioned earlier, it was the best method of communication. It just needed time to develop. So when the telegraph line was finally completed on October the 24th of 1861, the Pony Express seized operations just two days later. This certainly wasn't the only reason as Russell Majors and Waddell had a financial situation that was rapidly falling apart. Not to mention, rates were extremely high. The going rate towards the end was a dollar per ounce. Now, that would be $32.24 in today's money, making it generally unavailable for the wider public. So for the most part, the Pony Express was utilized by businesses, newspapers, and politicians. By its closure in 1861, its total costs were $700,000, or $22.5 million in today's money, for a profit of just $500,000, or $16 million today. This deficit was evident from the start, so Russell accepted stolen government bonds to balance the ledger. The law caught up with him in December of 1860 when New York police forces arrested him. Majors had prepared for bankruptcy even before the bond scandal, and despite once being untouchable in business, the firm fell apart. But regardless of its financial situation, the Pony Express's only failure was its inability to turn a wider profit. In 18 months, it made 308 complete runs, covering a distance of 616,000 miles. 
and with that distance, one could circle the Earth over 30 times. Not including the one lost mochila, it carried 34,753 letters and always met its deadlines. Come rain or shine. But what happened to the line's physical infrastructure? Well, the stations used by the Pony Express still stand today, many being older than the states they occupy. There are three in Missouri, 13 in Kansas, 38 in Nebraska, two in Colorado, 43 in Wyoming, 27 in Utah, 47 in Nevada, and 24 stations in California. And beyond those physical remnants, its legacy is most certainly not lost, as every June, people from all across the country come together to ride across the Pony Express's trail again, carrying a mochila as the riders once did in the times of the old. Despite being in service for only 18 months, the Pony Express changed the nation's views of westward expansion. It created the romanticized idea of the Wild West by funneling adventures of grand heroism to people all across the country, and eventually the world. The trail still remains to this day as a reminder of the glory days of the West. And while you may or may not have seen a shootout at high noon back in the day, you definitely wouldn't miss the Pony Express pulling into town carrying the stuff of legend in its saddle and mail too. So keep this story alive by sharing, subscribe to its history for new videos every Thursday and Saturday. And until next time, this is your host, Ryan Sokash, signing off.